Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the AUD podcast channel. I'm your host Khaled Abul Jabain. We are honored to have Dr. Eddie Surur as our guest on the show today. Dr. Eddie has been a professor and researcher at Indiana University for more than 30 years. The main focus of his research has primarily been on stem cells and their efficacy in addition to exploring other areas such as veterinary medical sciences and hematology. In this episode you learn the realities of a career in research, the importance of pre-med before entering scientific fields, the importance of publishing as a researcher, and how funding research works. Please join me in welcoming to the show, Dr. Eddie Suru. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your time today and for agreeing to come on the show. We really appreciate it. So, um, Dr. Edward, you have a very unique background in lots of different, you know, fields of uh, fields of medicine. Um, you even have a PhD in uh, veterinary medical sciences, which is quite, you know, different than what you typically, you know, find with doctors, especially in the discipline that you've gone into. But we, what we wanted to understand from you today is to talk about, you know, the history of your, you know, your career. What advice do you have to upcoming, you know, medical students that are looking to enter the field? How have the demands of the field changed, you know, over the over the years and so on? But before we get into everything, Dr. Eddie, why don't you give all of us a little bit of background about yourself and then we'll take it from there. Okay. Um, so I joined the AUB in Lebanon, Beirut uh, in 1970. No, sorry, 75. Okay. I was still in school in 70. <laughs> uh, in 75. Um I graduated in 79 with a degree in agriculture. Okay. My first in inclination was to become a veterinary uh, me medical school. But I couldn't go there because there is no veterinary medical school in the Middle East. Really? So th there aren't any. Oh, okay. That's so interesting. So I ended up going to the next best thing, which was animal virology. So I had a master's in animal virology, and I left in 81 to go to the States to get a PhD in, some, in immunology. Now, why that did I go into immunology is because the, my advisor in the, um, in the, at the AUB was, um, had gone to Illinois to get a PhD in immunology. So I followed in his footsteps. Okay. So I ended up getting a um, degree in veterinary because the, 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 my advisor was in the school of veterinary medicine. So I ended up getting a degree from the veterinary school in Illinois. But it was an immunology, pure immunology. What I studied was, was how malaria causes T-cell immunosuppression in patients so, using an animal model. Okay. okay. So, and then I went for a fellowship. They, at, at that time, I was looking for anything in pure immunology. But I found a, um, the guy who recruited me was, was, a, um, was the head of a human a bone marrow transplantation at Indiana University. So what what he wanted to do was to somehow look at the infection that happens to patients who undergo stem cell transplantation following a, a, a bone marrow transplantation because at that time there was no peripheral blood or a, it was all in bone marrow. So. Um, I went to IU, and I stayed there for 30-some years. Wow. That's it. So in, it's, inter it's interesting that you initially wanted to go into uh, veterinary school and then transitioned into medicine because there wasn't a school available to study that in the Middle East. Right. My, my question is, Was did you go into medicine as... Was it... Were you comfortable making that shift into medicine, or was there ever did you was there a part of you that's like that I really wanted that's I, what I really wanted to do? I, I never acquired a, a degree in medicine, so I'm not a medical doctor. 
I'm, I'm a PhD that, that does research in stem cell biology. So all my work has been done in the human system, more or less. Okay. But I don't have a medical degree. I, I, only, I have a PhD, but my work focuses on uh, human uh, adult stem cells. Okay. So, cause, so stem cells was something that I, for example, started hearing about only maybe 15, 10, 15 years ago. I know they've probably been around for longer. But I feel like the field has accelerated so much in such a short amount of time. And particularly with stem cells, because um, I watch, you know, uh, like fighters and all of them go, you know, to like places and they get stem cells to like heal and treat. My question to you is, I guess, stem cells seem like, from an outsider's perspective that doesn't understand medicine. Stem cells seem like uh, like magic, but does it have its limitations? <sighs> You're asking the wrong person because I personally don't believe that stem cells, the only stem cells that work are blood stem cells. They have been proven clinically to work in, in stem cell transplants. All, they try to use them in other settings, but the, in my opinion, they don't work. They give you some relief of some sort, but they are never using the right control. So it's not, so it's, it's only a cure in certain scenarios. Otherwise, it's just more like a treatment. It helps to relieve situations. Could you give but us an example? For, for example, the, 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 the ones that I'm familiar with is if you have a heart attack, they inject stem cells that are derived from the bone marrow. They purify them and they inject them into the heart. They, they claim that the left ventricular output is, is better. Okay, statistically it might be better, but they use as a control uh, saline or, mm. or water or so, some fluid. If you use a cell in place of the fluid that you use as a control, I will bet you, you will get the same result. Really? That's very and, interesting. And most of those are, most of these studies are done in places where you don't have to, to gain or to, to submit the study for IRB approval. So these are just studies that are coming out of places without that final, I guess, check that would allow it to be published in like a journal or so on. No, they get published. They get published in very important journals and in, in high ranking journals. But they don't have, in my mind, mm -hmm. they don't have the right control. What in, okay, in your mind, what should the right control be? A another cell. Ah, uh, okay. To make it like a one, to make it a fair comparison from your perspective. To make perspective. it a fair comparison, they use cells versus saline, cells versus versus PBS. That's not the right co uh, control. Very, very interesting. Okay, I never. I, I guess I never really looked at it from that so perspective. So because the, there is the, the the body will put a paracrine response to anything that you inject anywhere. Uh, now, they are cells that they take from, the, from, the own, from your own bone marrow. So they are autologous. But that doesn't mean that the cell was there to begin with. These are stem cells that, that survive in the bone marrow and come out to the blood, mm. or their progeny come out to the blood. It doesn't mean that they, that they will enter the heart. Mm. But put another cell, an autologous cell, in the heart, and you'll probably get the same response. Very interesting. Obviously, I'm the last person in the world who could understand or even begin to like, comprehend that, but I get what you're talking about. Let's compare apples to apples instead of apples to oranges. So I, yeah. I, I, get, I, I get where you're coming from. It's a very fair thing to say that you're comparing apples to bananas mm -hmm. whereas you should compare apples to apples yeah exactly i i, I get where you're i get where you're coming yeah. from with that so 
You went to the States, you've been there now for, I don't know, 25, 25 plus 40 years. years. Wow, 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> 40 years. Um, 40 years. And so uh, throughout your career, you've been primarily a, a researcher. Correct. In investigating different types of, you know, infectious diseases and, and so on. Is that, would that be a fair assumption? No, I, I, th yes or no, yes or no, because I, I, I focused on stem cells mm -hmm. and I studied first aspects of the stem cells, what defines the stem cells, because you see in the 80s when I started doing this, there were very little markers that identify human versus murine stem cells. So I focused on markers that identify stem cells. And then I, I ventured out into the what makes a stem cell divide mm. without losing its ability to remain a stem cell. Because okay. once, once you take a stem cell out of the body and you uh, entice it to divide, it will lose the stemness. It will become a more mature cell. It will no longer b remain a stem cell. So it will actually completely change it once you take it into that different environment. And you induce it to, to, and to, ask it to, to proliferate. Like, okay, gotcha. Even once or twice, it will change its nature. So as a, as a researcher, how did you go about deciding what areas you kind of wanted to like investigate or what studies you wanted to carry out? Because I, you're a professor as well. So is how does that, what's your, what was your role like when you're at a university as a professor and a researcher, what does that look like? Okay, as a professor, I was lucky in that I was only responsible to give four or five lectures a year. Oh, a year. A oh, year. okay, okay. And I only lectured on stem cell biology. Okay. So all, all through my life, I've been concentrating basically on my research. So I... I never had a course to teach. If I could taught something, it was because I was invited to give a lecture. Mm. So I was, I never had the responsibility of teaching. So I always wanted to focus on my research, which I could do. And I was, I was able to do that. Yeah, and when, uh, I'm, I'm curious when it, came, when it comes to research, because you mentioned you've been, you've conducted research in lots of different areas. When you first started out, was there like, you're like, my goal from like, as a researcher, by the time, you know, I'm done, is this, this is the big, the overarching big problem that I want to do my best to like, try to tackle. What, what, did you have something like that? Or through time, you kind of well, now have one? You know, what's the, how did well, it work? You, you, you have to, to realize that in 1980, no, not 80, 85, 86. When I first started in this field, very little was known about stem cells. Okay. And people wanted to learn more, of course, like any other field, to learn more. But the first thing they, they had to know was, what is a stem cell? It, it constitutes less, it's, it's roughly one in in a hundred thousand or or even less mm. from the bone marrow cells that you that you pull out of the bone marrow excluding all the red cells how can how can you isolate it how can you identify it and that's what i focused on and the 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 even though you would discover very little during that time it was a big deal because Nothing else is known about it. So, so where do you see? I guess you, uh, so. Now you've been researching it for you know for the last like thirty plus years. Where do you see we are today in that? I guess in that field, or is there still a lot left to like figure out? Oh, well, in we, your opinion, we we know now a hundredfold more, a thousandfold more than we knew back in the 80s. Wow. There is still an, uh, f many, many more faults to look for. We, d we still don't know much. Yeah. But we know now more than we did in the 1980s, and we're happy with it.
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <I'm sorry. laughs> yeah. If that's the if that's, that's the our... if that's the return on information, yeah, you guys have done a great do- a great yeah. job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was I recently had someone uh, a science he's a, he was he's a scientific researcher on my podcast uh, recently and I asked him um, is research an art or a science so I'm gonna um, before I give you what <laughs> before I give you what he said I want to ask you I want to ask you that question and see where do you fall because you know you've been in research pretty much your entire career is it an art or a science well you have to have an artistic talent of some sort you 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 dream of things at night let's say or while you're driving to work but if you're if you're not talented in the way you think about how to get to it how to ask the question and how to go about answering it uh, you cannot do it and you certainly need some some artistic talent to to figure your way around things it is not only science yeah you need the science to know what to ask but you need other talents to to know how to get to it because it, it's it's okay to ask a question but how do you answer it that's that's the main question so is the is what's more important asking that question that initial question or finding the answer to that question both <laughs> okay. if, if you can, if you scientifically sure if you cannot ask the question you cannot answer it fair so you have to have the the scientific background and preparation to ask the question but then when you ask it you have to rely on some other talents to figure out how do I get around answering this question? What tools do I use? What methods do I use? Yeah. Now, of course, you're relying on science for the final answer, but sometimes th- there's, a, there's an easy way to get to it. Yeah. That you can only, uh, you can only approach by having some, some talent that's that that's different than science yeah it's funny he said he said exactly uh, something very similar to you he said it's def- he said it's definitely not a science and you both were sh- uh, kind of r- were saying the same thing in the sense that th- while the content or there might be some scientific tools that are used in research the actual overarching way you conduct research is there's an art to it. There's a yeah. talent, there's a creativity that you have to have to use that. Th- there is always a, a lengthy way and there's always a, a shorter way. It may be crude, it may be, but, but it, it puts you on the right path. And if you're not talented artistically to think about it this way, you'll never know it. You can spend as much time as f- and never get an answer. Why not find it in, in the shorter way to begin with and then invest in the long, uh, l- lengthy way to do it? True, yeah. You know, as they say, work, work, work smart, not hard. Yeah. You, know, you know, find yeah. the, there's more than one way to achieve to this. To skin a cat. Yeah, uh, you are. There you go. Like, <laughs> exactly. Um, so in the, field of, in the field of research, obviously, uh, you would know better than anyone. Uh, with time and with perspective comes new information and new hindsight. Because I'm sure, like, kind of like when we started the conversation, when you started in the stem cell field compared to now, it's there's a thousandfold. But I guess the challenge I find is we are. I think us as people, we need we like absolutes. We don't like things that are ambiguous. So. When you tell me as a, you can, and the problem with research is that you can only give me this answer as of today, today, because in X amount of time, that might not be the case. Does that make you, f- I feel that is a very humbling thing in that field. Yeah. Uh, I mean, s- the science, but the, the world of biology is not, an, is not an exact science. There's only physics and math that are exact science. One plus one equals two. It will never change. But what what I came up with and what I say today 
there, there might be someone who would come and totally refute that with, with evidence, with, with good science. That's, that's the way it is. I mean, you, it will always change. It, it, there is no definite answer. So be it. Yeah, so I, I guess is, there's no definite answer. Is you can only give your, the best answer based on what information I have up to this point. And the technology available to obtain that answer. Now, it will never change, for example, that we are made of cells. Okay, but when you get into the minute little details of, of everything, things will change. I, I'm sure they will change. Yeah. I guess then the next, uh, because w with research, I didn't even know, I wasn't even aware that there's different types of research and uh, research for academia, research for industry and different uh, types of research will bring in different objectives and Correct. then this opens a whole world of, you know, can we trust it? Can you not? Is it biased? Is it not? So obviously with research, there's always, um, going to be internal unconscious biases that are going to come into it yeah so i guess now reflecting on your career do you feel like you're more aware of your biases now than before or is it something that it's just a blind there's only so much and there's i'm always going to have a blind spot regardless i i wouldn't call it a bias as such for for example okay i i worked on molecules called CD166 for years, for, for 15 years maybe. Wow, 15 but, years. But uh, my, my uh, inspiration was to make it important in everything. M maybe it is a bias, but it's, but it's not that you are biased towards a molecule a, or something. But this is what you spent your life working on. You wanted to be involved in everything and make it as important as can be. Mm. Uh, you can call it a bias if you want, but if the data don't support that, you would be an idiot to, <laughs> to, to say it is. Yeah. But it's not. Yeah. You, you, would, you would say it's not. Yeah. And the data is the evidence at the end of the day. Yeah, that's why I say it's not a bias because a bias would make you say untrue things, in my opinion. Okay. But uh, if it's untrue, it's untrue. It's not involved in this, it's not involved in that, it's involved in whatever. Yeah. And, and you continue to work on it. You be, what scientists need to do in, in all their quests is to find something that they are the experts on. Mm. I became the expert on CD166. No one else knew more about it on the hematopoietic cells. Mm. No one else knew about it on the hematopoietic cells than me, Yeah. for example. Yeah, yeah. So pick, I guess, pick the thing you want to dedicate your yes. research to and just go, go, go at do it. it. Go, <laughs> yeah. go do it. Yeah. So, um, with a obviously with a scientific uh, or medical background and so on, a lot I think a lot of young students probably think that that only way I can make use of this is if I go into like if I become like an actual doctor and go into medicine and no. do this exactly. But um, r to go into research, I feel I from my my perspective, I feel to be a researcher, you have to be a certain type of person. You have to be you have to have certain characteristics um because and like you said you spent fif 15 years on a mole like on yeah, one molecule you know that you need a you need to be a certain to have a certain personality to be able to do that um my question is what i'd like to ask you is could you give us some insight onto the realities of the field like if I, if there's any young students listening to this right now that are considering um a career in research what are some very important things that they should keep in mind before, you know, making that long term, okay. you know, dedication? OK, one one thing we didn't talk about is that research costs money. Uh, yes, we have. Right? Yeah, 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 very you, true. You don't have a pot of money 
that you can reach into and spend as much as you'd like. So you, what you have to do is to convince somebody in charge of money to give you some of it because what you have is an interesting idea that would lead to something. So funding is one thing that you have to keep worrying about. M money does not grow on trees, okay? Mm. So you have to think of, of certain things that will make your research um, palatable to those people that hold the money so that they will give it to you. You may have the brightest idea, but if you cannot package it in a mm. way that will obtain money, it doesn't matter. You will never get money, and you cannot do it. So you have to think of uh, the fundability of your work. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is, does it, does it go anywhere? The, is, is the work that I, I was blessed in that I looked for something that doesn't do, I mean, humanity would not care if the stem cells express CD166 or not. <laughs> I was able to sell it. Yeah. You have to sell your product. Mm. And I was able to sell it and get money and do work. But would I have chosen something else? I don't think scientists live long enough to uh, try this and this and this and that and, and pick and choose what they want. They have to choose what is sellable, what is attractive to, to fund, funding agencies, mm. get the money, put their head down and work and publish. Because you want to be known at the end of the day that you are best known for this, pro for, for this particular thing. So it, it. it sounds like in your, in your field, uh, being a jack of all trades or having your arms in too many different research things is actually a disadvantage to you, not an advantage. Absolutely right. Okay, that's very, that's so counterintuitive you, to what you'd hear outside you, of that, you know, you, that industry. You cannot put your hands in, you cannot put too many pots on the fire. Something will burn. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> have to, you, you have to concentrate on one, mm. a, a very attractive one, something that will sell and, and has value to humanity. And you can, you can succeed. You have to put your head down, not worry about what the, what the others say, and keep on working. So I'm so happy you brought up the funding aspect of research because that's something I haven't touched on like previously. Uh, but listening to you, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, research does cost money, but you think it, uh, logically it wouldn't. Uh, okay, so let me use, let's use your thing for your, your case, for example. So you went, you got the, fun, you got the funding for the research. What, what, then what do you have to actually go do? I'm genuinely curious, do you, what, what, where's the cost? What's your cost in carrying out this research? Is it people, is it equipment, is it just man hours? Is it, okay. like, what goes into I, that? I'll, I'll give you the example of the US, which I'm familiar with. Okay, okay. sure. So when you, when you get the grant, you have to rent your lab. Because okay. you, you are staying in a lab, it's like a house. You spend more time in, in the lab than you do in, at home, relatively speaking. <laughs> 50 but, so you, you are in a building. Okay. Someone built that building, someone uh, collects the trash, someone cleans it, someone et cetera, et cetera. So you have to pay rent. Okay. That's part of the money. Okay. Part of the money is you, you use animals. Use mice. Okay. Those that don't come for free. Okay. Every okay. mouse costs a some a, an amount of, of dollars. You have to buy them. You have to house them. You have to to find someone who takes care of them. The animal house husbandry and care. They they cost money. That's <laughs> You're another, blowing my mind right now. I've never a, even thought of these things. That's okay. another search. Uh, another cost. Um, you have to have equipment in, in the lab, a balance, let's say, 
a microscope, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those cost money. You have to buy them. They don't come for free. Then you have to do your own research, media, CIRA, uh, and so on, pipettes, glassware, mm. plasticware. Everything costs money. Mm. You have to buy it. All of this has to be budgeted. Otherwise, there's no money for it. And that is, and all of this budget is in the plan that y you put together to present for this grant. Yes. Got you. Okay. Yes. Okay. 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 You 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 have to imagine yourself doing the work. It will cost me ten mice. It will cost me a hundred bucks to house them. It will cost me antibodies to label the the, the, the cells. It will cost me the salary of a researcher that will work for me. Mm. I have yeah. to pay them. So yeah. you add it all up and you submit it as part of your budget. And is the, the, and that's so you present the budget that gives you run rate for X amount of time. Let's say now that would give us uh, three years of run rate. Okay. Right. Three years are done now. Here we are. We've conducted this much research. What next? That's, thank you. Exactly. What next? Like how? Because if okay, nothing has come up. No, nothing has come of it now. So what then is? Because then the question becomes like, what do I need to have to show them that this is worth continuing? Uh, how long is this going to take? You know, all all these okay. kind of questions start popping up. Uh, again, I'll give you the example of the U.S. The the biggest funding agency is the NIH, National Institutes of Health. Okay. Okay. So you apply for a grant, it's usually five years. You begin working. You have all the money you want, you begin working. Everything is working fine. You have to start thinking by year three of writing another grant because it, there's a chance it won't get funded. It will take you a year to, to regroup. That's already in year four. Now you get money for another five years, so you're, you're set for 10. So, so you have to, to keep doing this. Really? I, I, I spent like uh, 40 per, more than 40% of my time writing grants. Wow. You are begging for money from various agents. And as, so as the university, you were working at uh, Indiana Uni uh, University, right? Uh, so you're, you, were, you were a researcher there. The, re the university obviously has, its, uh, I'm sure it has its own like, resources and stuff like already. Who is the one who, dis like, who makes that final decision? Is it the, because, I'm, so you're, you're employed at the university. So I'm paying you a salary to conduct research. Mm -hmm. And in, in, is it one of your responsibilities that you have to go out and get grants to do research? What, what, <laughs> I, did not, what I did not allude to in the, the grant funding is I have to bring in my own salary. Oh, okay. So I have to write 20% on this, this grant 25% on this grant, and so on. Depending on the, on the university, you have to, to bring in somewhere between 70 and 80% of your salary. If they have the salary, they, you are allowed to stay and conduct research. If you don't bring in the salary, the, it, it will vary. <laughs> they can give you two, three, four years, and then they'll say goodbye. You, you, you're, not, you're not bringing in any money. Why should we keep you? Wow. They get rid of you. Yeah. That's such a tough spot. I'm begging it, for it money is. that I need to do my research, but I also need this to pay my salary to make sure I'm still employed so they keep paying my salary so I have more time to get... Yes. Wow, yes. that's a lot. That's a, that's a lot. You, th that is always on your mind. Yeah, it's just like... Because if you don't bring in your salary, you're at the risk of being fired. Or if you're tenured, your salary being reduced and reduced and so on until you yourself leave. 
Oh, I, mean, I never thought of that actually. Yeah, because ten year obviously job for life, but you never I never knew that that doesn't that doesn't mean salary for life. <laughs> it's it's not it's not a school of of arts and sciences. Mm. You're you're I'm not responsible for teaching. I, I told you I taught four or five lectures. They can do without that. Wow. I'm supposed to be doing research, writing that Indiana University produced this paper. If I cannot do it, it's the end of me. What determines, I guess, on the research aspect, what determines whether research is... Because I can, I can imagine research can do two things. Research, one, one scenario is, oh, we did research, we didn't accomplish our objective, but we learned something here. Yeah. Another one is, oh, we did our research and we actually got our objective. Which is more val like valuable? Just because, because even though this didn't get the objective, what I learned from this could be the game changer to the, the next thing. Well, they're, they're both valuable. Okay. Especially okay. number two is more valuable than number one. But you never accomplish it in, in a matter of years. We're talking about four or five years. You don't get that. You, you have to, to work and work and work, and you'll get it in 10, 15, whatever. But every time you, you get two or three, the way I see it, is that you are writing a book. Okay. Every time you finish a chapter, you finish a chapter, now, it, now it's time to write it. The, the, what, what your responsibility is, is to write a good story. I like that. If, if you can write a good story, you can publish it in a journal. That what, what keeps us going is publications. Mm. You publish or you perish. Oh, is that, is that what they that's, say? That's the saying. You publish or you perish. So, every time you collect enough um, pieces of, of information, you put them in a story, you write the story, you, you put an ending to it, and you publish it. And you hope for the next chapter to come back later on. Interesting. Because publishing is not going to take uh, a month or two. It takes years. I mean, sometimes I just published a paper. It took about four years to publish. Wow, four years. But, but while I'm publishing, I'm continuing work. And I've published others since, since it was done. But... It is, it is a ring in the chain. Got you, okay. And it will continue, the ch it, will, it will lengthen the chain. And wh why is, why is the, the publishing part like so important? What if you're still, you're doing all this, but I'm not publishing, but I'm still gaining all of this like knowledge about my research? For two reasons. Okay. One is you want to tell the community that the work on X, has resulted in why. Now they can read it and, and find out and build on it. You're not the only one working on something. So you, you, others are waiting for your research to come out to, to know which direction they want to go. Uh, yeah, it's, you need, everyone needs each other. Everyone needs one another to, to, to find a way where to go, what to do next, mm. what, is, uh, what is known about what's new in the field. So in, in that example that you just used, uh, let's say there's two researchers, uh, you guys are both um, researching the same thing in different parts of the world. What is the, dif what is the characteristic or what's the quality that would make someone be like, uh, Dr. Eddie really, is, is a great researcher. This guy's a good researcher, but that guy's great. Good to great in research, what, like, how do you differentiate that? What makes someone a good researcher versus a great researcher? That's a good question. It, it all depends on the quality of publications. 
The quality of publications. Right. Okay. Um, if they delve into two, into uh, um, details that, that, that one researcher does not delve into, then that puts them in a, at a higher status. Because you've taken a broader view on this. You've taken a more, pr more precise look at one thing versus the other. You, you delved into it more, in more details. So the, de the depth of my details in the work is the difference? In most cases. Okay, okay. Sometimes you, you can't go deep because there isn't much known. Yeah. So you, you, you take a 10,000 foot approach and you look at, the, uh, you look at something mm. and that's all you can do. Let me, okay, let me ask you this question, because I, uh, because, uh, I asked him. If you wanted to define research, how would you describe it? Let's say you've, I'm a brand new person, I've never heard this word before. What is research? What would you say? Uh, you, you have to have commitment to, to to, to convince yourself that this is something that I'm, I'm going to succeed at. Okay. Now, we've talked about success, but for every successful ending, or a, remember I told you publication is a story? Yeah. Okay, it has to have an ending. Okay, for every successful ending, there are tens and tens <laughs> of failures. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. You, you do an experiment that doesn't, it doesn't succeed. You get failures or you get something that you cannot explain. You scratch your head and you say, how can I explain it? I cannot. So you, you go back to square one and you start all over again. I feel... You have to have a commitment mm. and the... the I, I don't have an, another, you, another word. Yeah. Other than that commitment to keep trying and trying and trying until you succeed. Yeah, he the, um, it's he kind of says it in a uh, in a similar way that it's your your commitment to finding the seeking the truth, whatever that truth might yes. be for you. Yeah, you know whatever that means to you. That's what you know. That's kind of like what yeah. it, what it comes down to at the end of the day. You you have to be truthful with yourself if you. You have to write the story in a way that there is no doubt or raise a question mm. that someone will ask, what if, the, what if this happened? Could it change the story? For the, for the story that I'm telling you now, I think I wrote enough of them to know that I wrote that there were no questions. Wait till my next chapter comes out and I'll tell you some more details. But yeah. I don't have it now. Yeah. It's such a... <laughs> it's a, And I think you said... Yeah, the word you said of commitment, dedication, and it's... it's. For example, when... Uh, like, I, I look at starting like a research project kind of like starting a business. You have to believe at the beginning that, like, this is going to work. There's a very, very good chance, though, that it won't. But I feel like in your field, it's m people are more comfortable with failure than they would be in like failure in building a business, for example. I don't know why, but I feel like it's just it's part, but it's part of that. It's part of this world too. But, but, well, when I do, you get what I'm trying to say, like no, the comparison. No, some, not everything is a complete failure. Okay. Some things are a complete failure. You throw them out and you start all over again. But everything will teach you something. Exactly. It's, it's whether you're lucky enough that this, these, com these incomplete failures added up to something that you can write and get more funding to start all over again. Okay. So and and, and to, write, to write a story using them. Yeah, so to, cre uh, to create the, the failure story to springboard the next chapter. Yeah, now you cannot publish a failure, but you can make something out of it.
<laughs> I really like that. Yeah. I really like that. That's that, that that's fair, you know. And and uh, what you said about uh, although you can't, the, uh, if you can create a story out of those failures or those things that didn't work out, you can have a pretty compelling story of why it's the other way as well. You know why something is not this, this is way. Why it's not an exact science? There you go. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. That, that's. See, there's another. Now you mentioned it a while ago. Now there's a difference between doing research in an academic institution and doing research in a pharmaceutical. Yeah. Because in in pharma they want you to find a way to get from here to there. If you don't get there, or if their budget does not allow you to get there, they will ch they will abandon the whole thing and and go somewhere else. In academia, you, you, you're a cowboy. You're, yeah, yeah, you can it sounds do, like it. Yeah. You can do. You can you can certainly do whatever you want that brings you money. Money is a big deal in academia. In pharma, it's not. Someone is providing you with the money mm -hmm. to do the research. Yeah. In academia, you have to fund your own way to do whatever you want to do. Yeah. Is it sellable? It, do I put a compelling story to sell it? Yeah. That's all you have to worry about. And it's not. It's not easy. Yeah. And uh, honestly, I. Uh, I never knew the the ins and outs of what um, a professor and researcher at a university like goes through or how it works and the funding. I've never talked about any of these things. It's so interesting because it gives you a completely different perspective on what this role and this career actually you know entails. So for the people, for the young people that want to are considering, you know, pre-med and doing all these things before taking that next step into either research and medicine and so on. How important, in your, from your perspective, is that pre-med phase before you jump into any of these? It's very important because it gives you the foundation of, of any knowledge that you need to carry on later in life. If you become an MD, having successfully completed the pre-med and gone into MD, it's the foundation. You, you, you don't think about it, but it's there. It's what got you to being an MD. If it's not, if you don't if you don't succeed in becoming an MD, it's not a loss. It's it prepared you to become something else in life. Yeah. Uh, you can you can become a researcher. Yeah. Now it's becoming more and more difficult because funding is getting more and more difficult. Because science, let, let's face it, it's not that important to many. If you, if you take a, a, a country, they have tens of worries before science comes to the table. Mm. So money is scarce. And there are more and more and more scientists seeking the same pot of money. So it's becoming less and less. But if you want to become a successful researcher, you have the right foundation to build upon, to become, to go after a training to become a researcher, or to, to go into pharma and work. You need it. You have yeah. to have this foundation. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, I love what you said there uh, and the examples you gave that, you know, uh, kind of like what I touched on earlier that uh, this foundation will open you up to so there's so many different ways to use this foundation but Correct. without this foundation you can't pursue any of them right right yeah so right. that's like it's the first step before you can even you know start thinking about you, what's next. you have to have a solid foundation so it's not it's not wasted education it's something you will carry with you it will lead you to to something good either in medicine or in some other field. It doesn't have to be medicine. Exactly. Reflecting on your career, uh, Dr. Edwards, if I ask you this question now, 
how would you describe it? Has the research you initially set out to be, if you were, if you were answering, would you say it was a success? It's not, or did it play its part in opening up door two? Well, the, the, the thing is that, that what I think of is, imagine this picture being a jigsaw puzzle. Okay. I, I just managed to put one or two pieces in the right place. I, I didn't do, I mean, certainly you want, to, you want to be an Einstein, <laughs> yeah. but not everyone is an Einstein. I, I, I put some, some pieces in, in the jigsaw puzzle, that's all. But I, I love that. I put them in the right place. He put them in the right <laughs> Exactly. It's about yeah. putting them in the right place. You're 100% right. And I love, by the way, guys, he's referencing a picture of the university behind me. Um, <laughs> but and I love that analogy because it, it just says it all there. And um, Dr. Eddie, you've been, this has been such a fun conversation for me. I, um, this is a field that I, again, know nothing about. I was very fortunate. That I, rec I had a conversation recently that, enabled me to ask better questions of a researcher. But the, uh, the message we're trying to give out with this uh, podcast is that success comes in many forms and that learning never stops. Correct. Now, is in your field uh, and in your work as a researcher, you probably have learned more things than probably many, <laughs> many of us have because you're actively trying to like seeking that out. But if there was one learning or one piece of advice that, you know, that comes to mind if you had to just tell someone that one thing that really was a game changer for you, what was it? The, the, you're, you're asking me if I can identify a eureka moment. Sure. The, uh, well, the, the one thing I can tell you is those come very rarely and uh, far apart. Uh, what's a eureka moment for me? Um, when I found out that if you knock out, if you eliminate CD-166, you cause a lot of damage in the metabolic system. I don't know what that means, but I, tr uh, but I trust you. So <laughs> because that, that opened a lot of doors to me. I could get more funding. Mm. I could pursue that molecule. Yeah, and I was happy with it. <laughs> it's, uh, it sounds like it sounds like you have a very special relationship with this molecule, and that it served you well, you know, in your career. Um, Dr. Eddie, I want to say thank you so so much for coming on the show. This has been an absolute pleasure for me. I've learned so much from you today, and I think for any students or anyone looking to enter the field of medicine or research. There's so much useful st stuff that they can take from this conversation. So thank you. Thank you so much. My uh, pleasure. If people want to reach out to reach out with you, connect with you, uh, what's the best way? They to get are in more touch? than welcome. The best the best way is to use my my email address is at iu edu. You heard it here, guys. If you want to get in touch with Dr. Eddie, you have his email there. We'll put it in the show notes as well. Dr. Eddie, thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the AUD Podcast channel. We really hope that you enjoyed it and learned something from it. We have a lot of incredible guests lined up for you on the show, and we're so excited to bring you their inspiring stories. To stay up to date with all the latest episode releases, please make sure to like, share, follow, and subscribe to the podcast on the AUD Instagram page at AUD Dubai.